Good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Grace just introduced, this is uh, the fourth talk in our basic series about job scheduling with the job scheduler Slurm. Uh, if you were here in the uh, first uh, of the basics lessons, you probably uh, got it explained to you that the job scheduler is a piece of software that uh, keeps everyone's uh, work from running on top of one another. <coughs> Um, and Slurm is the particular scheduler that we use um, on Compute Canada and ACENET uh, new equipment currently. Sorry, i got to figure out how to advance my slides here. There we go. Um, right, I'm answering my own questions. So it's the job management software, also known as dynamic resource management software, and nobody uses that term. Um, it's there to make sure that um, when there's uh, a thousand users submitting jobs on a cluster that each uh, each computational task uh, gets its appropriate share of the resources <coughs> um, so that uh, we don't have jobs trying to run on too too many jobs trying to run on the same machine at the same time um, preventing as you might call it gridlock um, the slurm package includes both uh, software that that dispatches and terminates jobs and figures out when the jobs are going to run and since when the job is going to run is perhaps the most interesting aspect of this uh, it frequently gets called a scheduler <coughs> sort of a traffic cop for the cluster um, start with the very basics how do you interact with uh, the job scheduler you s the most common way to interact with it i will show you a couple more later on in the talk the most common way to interact with it though is by submitting a job script a job script um, is uh, really just a shell script um, the same thing as you heard about in yesterday's uh, talk on shell scripting um, <clears throat> with a few extra bells and whistles a few extra things added um, so we may have a job script uh, called simplejob.sh, and the .sh is optional, that's uh, a human convention, the computer doesn't care. Uh, a file named simplejob.sh, and um, there's going to be an opening line consisting of uh, the octothorpe and an exclamation mark and slash bin slash bash. We usually pronounce that hash bang bin bash, and that's just telling uh, the shell and the job scheduler what shell to use to interpret this file. It never changes. It's boilerplate. Just copy that into all your, your job scripts and don't worry about it. <clears throat> um, there may be uh, one or more, well, zero or more, I guess, technically, but typically one or more um, lines beginning with uh, hash s batch. Um, that signifies that this is a Slurm job script. There are other schedulers out there besides Slurm that uh, are used on some other systems, not on ours. Um, the Slurm uh, job scripts um, will have lines beginning with hash s batch that <clears throat> do things like specify the time limit that you want to impose on the job. Um, and uh, which account uh, you want to run the job under if you have access to multiple accounts for submitting jobs. Um, it's probably important to make a distinction between um, the uh, your login account or your username and your Slurm uh, account. Um, and then this is a Slurm account. Most of you will only have one Slurm account and you don't need to worry about that. Occasionally you might have, some of you may have access to more than one. Um, the meat of the job script, however, is simply a shell script, which is say some commands that could be executed by the shell, such as run my program, take the input from some input file. So what program to one write input it has. We'll expand more on some of the things you can do with this script <coughs> in successive slides. Um, but once you have such a script, then you submit it to the scheduler with the command sbatch. Um, batch uh, harks back to uh, the idea of batch processing. Um, each job is a batch of work, I think, is probably the etymology for that. In any case, the command sbatch takes a job script and submits it to the scheduler. And then the scheduler will typically respond with submitted batch job and some serial number. Uh, 
That job ID number will come up again uh, in a few different contexts in this talk. Essentially, it's, it's a unique number for a job on a given cluster, and they're handed out in order. Uh, it's almost unique, actually. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we rolled over the, uh, the job ID uh, counter on one of the clusters. I think it was Cedar. Um, which was a little surprising, but did not cause any damage. <laughs> so this basic command S batch <clears throat> submits a job to the job scheduler. Um, you can supply options to the S batch command, just like you can supply options to just about any shell command. Um, and the options for it look suspiciously like those hash S batch directives that were inside the script. So you can say S batch dash dash time equals 30 minutes and the name of the job script. Um, and that does uh, basically the same thing as if you put dash dash time uh, equals 30 minutes um, inside the script here. Uh, in, how do I stop doing that? Uh, okay. I'm messing about with annotations now. Clear annotations. There we go. Um, so uh, if you supply an option at the command line like this, showing on this slide, then that will override um, an equivalent option that you have inside the script. So you can set one inside the script and then <coughs> vary it when you're testing, for example. Most people just set them inside the script and leave it there. Most 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 users typically don't use this option, but it is there, and it's good to know that it's available to you. Um, once you have submitted a job with S batch, then uh, you may be curious what state it is, is it in? Is it finished? Is it running? Is it still waiting to run? The command you want to probe that is SQ, the letters SQ. Um, and when you run SQ, it'll give you a really wide output, which I will demonstrate here in a moment after I've explained this a bit, um, including such output as the job ID number that I just mentioned, the name, which is typically the name of this, the, uh, the script file that you submitted. Um, the amount of time that uh, the, the scheduler thinks is left for the job to run, if it's running, um, how many nodes it's using, how many CPUs it's using, what node it's running on, if you're interested in that information, it's not particularly useful information. Um, but you're mostly interested in the ST column, which stands for state. And it will show R if it's running. That's what you really like to see. Um, it will frequently show PD, which stands for pending, means it hasn't been started yet. The scheduler is still trying to find a place for it to go. And over here in the right hand end, it may show something like priority, which is <clears throat> a very uh, coarse grained reason for why it isn't running yet. Um, maybe waiting because it hasn't reached high enough on the priority list yet. It may be uh, pending because uh, the appropriate resources aren't available yet or a selection of more obscure reasons. Um, if you run SQ and uh, you get just the headers and nothing else back, an empty list in other words, that means that all your jobs are finished for good or for ill. They may have succeeded, they may have failed, but they're finished and out of the system now. Um, if you want more info about the sq command, you can do the standard shell thing, which is sq dash dash help, um, and it will tell you some stuff. You may, if you're really astute, discover from that that uh, sq is a wrapper around uh, a standard slurm command called sq u e u e, which is unfortunately pronounced the same way. <laughs> um, and so if you want to, to run the man command, you need to use the full spelling S-Q-U-E-U-E -U -E, or go online and look for slurm S-Q-U-E-U-E -U -E, uh, to find more about it that way. Uh, let me just demonstrate a little bit of what I've shown you so far um, by going to an actual <coughs> cluster. Um, and if, uh, if my terminal is not showing, would somebody please tell me right now? I think I've got my screen screen share set up properly for this. Um, let's see. 
Um, uh, oh, yeah, I didn't explain why we have both the short and the long versions of SQ. Uh, the full command SQ UE UE will report on every job in the system, not just yours. And since our systems frequently have several thousand jobs uh, in them, if you type SQ UE UE with no arguments, you will get several thousand lines of output, which is not usually what you want. Um, so the SQ short version wrapper uh, just tells you about your own jobs. That's why we have, that's the advantage of it. Um, okay, so just to I'm gonna blow this up a little bit. Um, so simple job dot sh. Here's um, a variation on the thing that I just showed you. Um, we have that boilerplate line at the top, just cut and paste that. We have a couple of S batch lines, including one saying uh, hour, one minute, zero seconds, one minute runtime for this, and an account line, which you may or may not need for your personal login. And then it's going to print hello world and it's going to do nothing for 30 seconds is what sleep does. And so I type S batch simple job.sh and it replies with job sequence number. If I type SQ quickly enough, I get this. Let me do that again. SQ. Yeah, you can see there's there's over 100 lines wide of output there. And so it wraps and it's a little bit ugly, which is why I showed you a condensed form on the slide. Um, but the features are there. There's the job ID. Um, there's the job name, which is not usually very interesting. There's the state, it's actually running. Um, the machine at what the point I hit enter on that figured it had 50 seconds left and some other information about it. So there's the basic operation of the S batch and SQ commands. Just for giggles, I'm going to show you what happens if you type the, uh, the bare SQ with nothing, since somebody asked. It does this, <laughs> right? Um, the time of uh, 00 colon 01 colon 00. zero. Um, we're actually about to talk about that, I think possibly in the next slide. Um, no, not quite. We'll come to that in a couple of slides, Luis. Um, keep the question in mind. Um, when my job ran, uh, it was supposed to send a hello world somewhere. Where did that go? So let's look here. Um, you probably don't remember because I didn't draw attention to it before, but a few moments ago, there was only one of these slurm something or other dot out files. Now there's two of them. And my job ID number, I believe was 47944501 when I ran SQ. I shouldn't have run it off the screen. That was a poor choice now, I realize. Um, but by default, this is where your output goes. So let's see what's inside slurm-479 tab completion is my friend. It says, hello world. We do an ls-l, that file was produced May 14th at 918. Um, this uh, machine is in a different time zone from us. So right there is where the output from my simple job went. And that's the default. Um, if you don't specify otherwise, it'll put it into a file called slurm dash job ID number dot out. If you really want to change that, you can. Um, you can supply an option dash dash output and give it some other file name. But we find it really handy, um, especially when it comes to troubleshooting, if the output from a job has the job ID attached to it. Um, if you write to us and say, my job's doing something weird, it crashed, it failed, I've only got half the output, uh, I don't understand what's going on, can you please help me? Um, very often, the first thing we want to know is, uh, can you give me the job ID number? Um, and if you've changed the uh, output file name, um, and you didn't like print out the job ID number and save it somewhere, you're, you might have a difficult time figuring out what job I, what, which job it was that went weird. So the easiest thing to do with that is just leave it at the default. But if you don't like the default, and certainly slurm dash whatever is not a particularly informative name, if you don't like the default, you can change it and still retain the job ID number using these percent things, uh, I think the documentation calls them meta variables, maybe. Um, so you can say output equals um, 
percent x will replace be replaced by the job name or the 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 file name by default again. Um, percent j will be replaced by the job ID number. So you can give your output file something with a percent j in it, and you'll still have the job ID number there, but you can set the name to be something more meaningful. You can also change the job name from being the name of the script to something more meaningful if you want with a job name parameter. Things you can do entirely optional. Um, suppose you did something wrong. You submitted the job and realized, oh, I asked for a minute and I really need an hour, but it hasn't started yet. Uh, there's no reason for that to go. Then the s cancel command will uh, terminate a job. It'll it'll take it out of the waiting list if it's uh, if it hasn't started yet. It will stop the job if it's already running. Um, is it possible to have multiple output files from the same job? Someone asks if you keep the default name. Um, you can only have one standard output file from the job script, but it is entirely possible um, in your job script to send output to other files using the, the output redirection operators. So um, this job script could have uh, slurm dash one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dot out as a standard output. And um, I could add uh, a greater than sign some other output file here. And that's where the output from the program proper would go. So in that sense, yes. There is also, uh, it's also possible to make a distinction between the standard output and the standard error stream from uh, shell commands. Um, which is also, uh, you can also split those up by default with slurm standard output and standard error both go into the slurm dash job ID dot out file, but you can split those if you wish to. Output basic commands as cancel. Um, yeah, uh, something uh, people occasionally worry about um, with canceling jobs is they're worried they're going to lose their place in the line. Um, our jobs are not scheduled on a first come first serve basis. It's considerably more complicated than that. Um, and I'm barely going to have time to touch on that today. Uh, but the short version is that canceling a job does not lose you your place in line. So uh, the simple thing to do if you've messed something up is simply cancel it and resubmit it with the right parameters. There, there's another thing you can do as well, but it's, it's not particularly useful. Um, uh, S update. Jeez, I can't even remember the command now. It's been so long since I used it. S cancel uh, will do fine. Um, and the job ID number, obviously. Uh, there's various other clever things you can do with S cancel if you care about it. Moving along, requesting resources time. Now we're returning to uh, Louis' question. Um, every job must have a runtime estimate. Um, the reasons for this are uh, a little obscure. Um, basically, the scheduler is trying to pack everything into the minimal to a, to a to a box with dimensions of time and CPUs. Cancel. Right, someone's returning to the previous slide. Yep. Okay. I'll ignore that. Um, resources. Time. Uh, essentially, the scheduler is trying to figure out how to pack um, a. a, a an enormously complicated box with dimensions of at very least time and number of CPUs and amount of memory. Um, and the box is divided into chunks because each node only has so many CPUs. Um, and in order to uh, do that packing as efficiently as it can, it needs to know um, what the dimension of time is on each of the jobs that it's trying to juggle. Um, it is possible to run a scheduler with unspecified time limits for jobs, but it's way less efficient. On top of that, um, the classic uh, computing uh, error that uh, most of us have made in our first year computing class um, is to write an infinite loop that never terminates. Um, it is still uh, way too easy to run a job that either never terminates or goes on far longer than it should. So um, to prevent waste of resources because the job is, has gone awry and it's just sitting there spinning its wheels instead of doing useful work, 
um, as well as the reason about scheduling that I just described. Um, we require that every job have a runtime estimate attached to it. There actually is a default runtime, but I don't even know what it is and we don't want you to use it. So I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what it is. Um, always supply a runtime limit. Um, the job will be killed when that limit is reached. So that you want that to be the outer limit for the amount of uh, time that you think the job is going to need to run. Um, and runtimes can vary uh, somewhat randomly, um, particularly because uh, input output on our, the input output systems, the input output facilities on our systems, the file systems, um, uh, are under considerable pressure and competition from other users. Uh, so your job may take a little longer or a little shorter to do its input output from one run to the next. Um, so the, uh, the, the syntax here is fairly obvious. The S, hash s batch, put it inside your job script, dash dash time equals. And uh, the long form is days dash hours colon minutes colon seconds. Um, if it's less than day, which probably most of them are, you can just use hours, minutes, seconds. If you only have one colon, it's going to interpret that as minutes. So don't get fooled and assume that, that means that, you, that one colon zero zero means one hour and zero minutes. No, it means one minute and zero seconds. Um, I encourage you not to use the single colon form because it's too easy to make that mistake. And no colons at all uh, will mean minutes, but the, the, the obvious one that, that means the same thing to humans all the time is either the two colon form or a day dash and uh, hours, minutes, seconds. Those are perfectly obvious to everyone who's reading it. Very hard to make a mistake with those. Um, yeah, since the job uh, is going to be terminated um, when it reaches that amount of run time, then you want to leave yourself a little bit extra. And how much extra is up to you, it depends on how confident you are about the, the runtime of your job. Other resources, can you ever spend a second? Or, yeah. um, uh, just to, to reiterate, the, the days, dash, hours, minutes, seconds is valid. Hours, minutes, seconds without any prefix is also valid. Other resources. Um, the next big dimension that the scheduler needs to deal with besides time is number of CPUs. These are high performance computing systems. Um, a uh, great number of the jobs that are run on them require more than one CPU because it's some form of parallel program that's running. Not all. We have a lot of serial programs that only require one CPU as well. Um, and in fact, uh, the example that I showed up front, the simple job didn't say anything about CPUs. It by default gets one CPU. So if you don't say anything about CPUs or tasks or cores or any of that stuff, then your job will get one CPU by default, one CPU core. Let me emphasize just in case there's confusion between CPUs and cores. It will get one core by default. Um, However, if you are running some some parallel program that needs more than one core, there are a number of ways to ask for it. Um, uh, the two uh, ones that are showing in this slide here um, reflect the two major types of parallelism that uh, a program may, may exercise. Um, some programs uh, using what we call distributed memory parallelism, parallelism have different processes and a process is a technical term. Basically it's a, a running program on a Linux system. Um, distributed memory uh, or MPI parallel programs use multiple processes, but more broadly, any kind of parallelism that wants multiple processes full scale processes, you should use n tasks or one of its variants. Um, you should ask for multiple tasks. So uh, to slurm a task maps to a Linux process. If your program uses shared memory or OpenMP or threads, and threads is probably the most common keyword of this nature these days, then what you want is CPUs per task. Um, if you're not sure which of these classes uh, your parallel program falls into, 
um, then you can do two things. You can read the documentation for your program uh, more carefully to see whether it says any of these keywords MPI or distributed memory. Um, then that's a sign you want end tasks. If it says threads or if it says shared memory or if it says open MP, then you want CPUs per task. And I have seen some that were completely obscure about this uh, and did not did not distinguish carefully between which type, presumably because the authors only knew of one type and didn't think it was important. Um, if you can't tell from the documentation, do not hesitate to just write us a support at computecanada.ca, support at ace-net.ca. Um, you know, with a link to the documentation for the for the application, say I'm trying to figure out whether this is an in tasks or CPUs per task uh, uh, thing I should be doing with Slurm. Can you help me out here? And we will we'll help you figure it out. Um, so those are the two basic ways to request CPU cores, in tasks and CPUs per task. I will direct your attention to the documentation here, docs.computecanada.ca, and you search for running jobs. Uh, let me just bring that page up, docs.computecanada.ca, some bookmarks away, and we have running jobs uh, down the left hand side here, it's the, the fourth thing you can click on, running jobs. Um, and this is a fairly long page with lots of details and even a few other pages to lead away from it as well. There's examples of job scripts, including something uh, uh, an example uh, job script for a threaded or open MP job, an example job script for an MPI job, and other pages that talk about more advanced things you can do. There are other options you have as well besides just end tasks and CPUs per task, um, but we're not going to spend time on those this morning. You can read about those in the documentation or you can write us for help with them if the documentation isn't doing it for you. Um, expanding on these, um, a multi-threaded or shared memory application, so one that uses dash dash CPUs per task, um, is one where all the cores need to be on a single machine. OpenMP is one of the ways uh, that uh, some of these programs are written, and if it's an OpenMP program, if that keyword OpenMP, no space, um, shows up in the documentation, then uh, typically you will need to set the number of cores for it to use via the OMP num threads environment variable. So what that's going to look like is this little chunk of code here. Here's the Slurm specification of CPUs per task. We've got four here for an example. Um, and then we uh, export uh, an a shell environment variable, OMP num threads and set the value of that environment variable to this other environment variable, Slurm CPUs per task, and then run the program. Um, what's going on here is that uh, when you specify uh, CPUs per task in, uh, to Slurm this way here, then it creates an environment variable called Slurm CPUs per task, except OpenMP programs want a different environment variable, so we just translate the one to the other. One could, uh, in principle, also export OMP num threads equals four to match the four here. Um, but this is just human psychology. We observe that if we have two numbers that are supposed to always match in a piece of code, then sooner or later you change it in one place and you forget to change it in the other, and they don't match anymore, and you're either wasting resources or trying to use more resources than you have available to you. <clears throat> So this trick means you can only you only set the uh, the thread count in one place and away you go. Other programs that don't use OpenMP or hide the fact that you're using OpenMP doesn't matter which um, might take an argument like dash T I see frequently. This is entirely dependent on the individual program. Again, you need to read the documentation, but you can use the dollar slurm CPUs per task trick in such a case as well, so that you only have to specify the number of threads in one place and they never get out of step with each other in different places. So read the program documentation for the details, use the slurm CPUs per task trick um, to make sure that the thread count appears the same in all the places where it's needed. Distributed memory applications, um, which as I said, may uh, have the keyword MPI in the documentation, or maybe they don't, um, are applications that can run on more than one 
computer at the same time and we'll talk to each other over the network. Um, our Slurm is configured so that uh, if you run an MPI program, Slurm and MPI uh, essentially talk to each other uh, setting uh, the, uh, sorry, let me start that sentence again. <laughs> um, you can set the number of tasks you want uh, with this Slurm directive in tasks. And again, I've picked four as an example number here. Um, and then you invoke the MPI program, which is probably going to be named something more interesting than MPI prog, um, with uh, the S run uh, meta command. Um, so S run name of the program um, and MPI and Slurm are set up so that if you invoke the program this way, um, the MPI program will get the correct number of tasks from Slurm directly. So um, although most program, most MPI programs will document that you can set the number of tasks by adding an extra argument in here, um, and they probably say that you can use MPI run or MPI exec, you don't need to supply the end tasks if you're, you, if you're running it inside Slurm. And by the way, you can also use MPI run or MPI exec here in place of S run, um, and also without re-specifying the number of tasks. But um, uh, we prefer S run because we get better accounting. Um, I've seen a few really weird corner cases where we had to use MPI run or MPI exec instead of S run, but 99% of the cases S run does the right thing for an MPI program. S run more generally will run any program will run multiple copies of any program, which is how MPI starts. But you can use it to to do something that's not MPI, but is similarly distributed across processes. So that was um, not just CPUs, but CPUs and a long digression to parallel program execution. Those of you who are not running parallel programs, um, sorry, you can pay attention now. Um, let me take a quick review of the chat here because I see it's been pretty busy. I think Oliver's keeping things clear. Um, um, and the, there is a bit of an interest, there's, there's two interesting questions, which I will amplify here for the recording. Um, does increasing the number of CPUs increase the speed of calculations? That is the hope, but it is by no means guaranteed. It is not magic. If your uh, application is written in parallel and a lot of detailed conditions are, are satisfied, then increasing the number of CPUs will increase the speed of calculations. But you do not want to assume that willy nilly and just go to a huge number because you want results really fast. That's probably not going to work. There's a, there's a great deal of subtlety to it. If you uh, want to, to learn more about that and you have the time, you could consider attending our uh, summer school in parallel programming, uh, which begins next week. Um, and we'll talk more about it there. We can talk more about it with you offline. Um, there is also the question of, um, uh, can you increase both uh, the threads and CPUs? Um, uh, first of all, uh, one thread typically executes on one core. Um, so CPUs per task uh, maps to threads. Um, it is possible to have a program that is both distributed memory and thread parallel so that both end tasks and CPUs per task apply, but it's fairly rare and should be reasonably clear from the documentation, we hope. Um, that's a pretty rare case. The, the hybrid case where you have both distributed um, and thread parallel is pretty rare. Generally, it's one or the other. So that's CPUs and CPUs for parallel programs. Memory is uh, the third dimension of the box that the scheduler is trying to fit everything into. Um, each machine in our cluster has a certain amount of uh, memory on board. Um, there uh, is a default amount of memory that you can get um, for your program. Um, 
I believe it varies by cluster and I'd have to look at the documentation. So I'd go back to the docs website that I just showed you a few minutes ago to, to get the, the lowdown there. Uh, but generally, um, you probably do want to think explicitly about the amount of memory your program is going to need. You can specify the amount of memory you want two different ways. You can say memory per CPU. Um, so 1,000 megs is another way of saying a gigabyte, approximately. Gigabyte, maybe 1,000 megs or 1,024 megs. Meh. Um, you can also specify uh, the total memory per node. So dash dash mem. Um, is memory per node. It doesn't say so explicitly, but that's what it means. The memory request is also a hard limit, much like the runtime is a hard limit. Um, if the job tries to uh, use more memory um, than you have alloc than you have asked for, then the job will be killed. Um, and if you haven't had to think about the amount of memory your programs require before, this may be a bit of a uh, bit of a shock. Uh, probably not so much a shock as as an annoyance. Um, and so, a few words about why we ask you to uh, specify memory. Um, if uh, a job, um, if if the processes on a, a compute node um, use all the physical memory available, the RAM, um, then uh, the job may crash, or worse yet, the job may just slow down ridiculously slow, and all the jobs on the the, the node will similarly slow down. Um, since on our GP clusters, Cedar, Graham, Beluga, and the uh, uh, ASNET Siku, um, you may share uh, a node with other users' jobs. Uh, we don't want that to happen, so we need to make sure that, that um, the total of the amount of memory being used by the various jobs belonging to different users doesn't exceed the physical memory on the host, and this is the mechanism we do it. Um, we have hosts of various different sizes. If you go to docs.compucanada.ca, you can find uh, descriptions of... Oops, stop that. We can find descriptions of various clusters over here, Graham, for example, and there will be a list of nodes at the bottom with the amount of available memory described here. GPUs are a, okay, let's, let me check the chat. Um, the question is, if a, a program has a memory spike but remains relatively low, uh, should we request the max memory to accommodate the spike? Um, short answer is yes. Uh, the memory monitoring actually does happen at discrete intervals, but they're very short. I can't remember whether it's every tenth of a second, every second, or every 10 seconds, something in that broad order. Um, uh, and the amount of memory that is being measured is not the uh, uh, not the virtual machine size, but the resident set size. Um, so you could actually do a, a malloc of a huge amount of space, and as long as it didn't write to it, you'd still be okay, if that means anything to you. If it doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. But the short answer is yes, um, you should request enough memory to cover the spike. Um, there are GPUs on our systems. How many uh, how many people listening today um, are interested in running programs on GPUs? Give me a little uh, green uh, thumbs up or sign or something if GPUs are of interest to you. One, two, three, four, five, six. At least six of you. Excellent. Um, not all our hosts have GPUs. Again, you can find that from the docs uh, site if you like. Um, but uh, each of our clusters, except Niagara, I think, um, have uh, at least some GPUs available on some nodes. Um, to request uh, one GPU, and you get the whole GPU uh, card when you do this, excuse me, um, you use the directive dash dash GRES equals GPU colon and however many GPUs you want to execute this job with up to the number available on the host, obviously. So check the documentation to see what the maximum number is. Um, GRES stands for generic resource, which is a totally useless thing to remember, but anyway. Um, so sbatch dash dash grass GPU one 
that will get you uh, one of whatever kind of GPUs are available on the system. Um, some of our systems have a variety of GPU models with considerably different performance characteristics. So you can also specify, for example, that you want a V100 GPU or a T4 GPU by adding it uh, into the specification this way, dash dash grass equals GPU colon model specifier colon one. There is extensive documentation about this uh, on the docs site again using GPUs with Slurm and uh, some of the individual cluster pages also have discussion of this. So docs.computecanada.ca, just search for GPUs, you'll find um, the, the lowdown there, but the short version is dash dash grass GPU equals GPU colon some number. Um, if you are in the position of running large scale distributed programs. So this is distributed memory parallel again, um, typically MPI. Um, and by large scale, I mean multiples of uh, the sizes of an individual host. So the, the individual hosts, the individual computers in our clusters are also of varying sizes. Let me show you the Graham page again, just because I have it up. Um, you'll see that at Graham, 903 of the nodes have 32 cores, a bunch more have 32 cores. There's a tiny number that have 64 cores. And there's a few more down here that have other numbers like 28, 40, 16, and 44 cores available in them. These, by the way, are mostly the uh, uh, GPU nodes that have got these weird core numbers. So um, if you are running distributed that is to say MPI parallel jobs that are going to use uh, large numbers of cores. And that means large compared to the size of an individual node. Um, and if you have tested that your code will use those, that large number of cores efficiently, um, then it makes sense uh, many times to ask for complete nodes. So if you just say dash dash in tasks, um, like dash dash n tasks equals 128, for example. Those 128 tasks could be distributed across a lot of nodes, potentially as many as 128 different nodes. Um, this isn't very efficient if you're trying to run a 128 core MPI program. Um, so uh, at scales like that, what you probably want to do instead is ask for a number of nodes, number of complete nodes um, with like 32 tasks per node. And this small n should match um, one of the available node types in the cluster. So 32 would be a good number in Graham because of all the 32 core nodes I just showed you. And optionally CPUs per task, because again, you can have this hybrid situation, although it's pretty rare. A little note for large parallel pro programs. Um, if you're not in that case, then you can just forget that entire slide. So testing, testing one, two, three, how do you get moving, move from doing nothing to doing something useful. You go through a little test phase. Um, we want to, uh, we want you to start with small test versions of your actual jobs. If you just jump right in the first job you submit is asking for 128 cores. The chance that something is going to go wrong and waste a lot of resources is very high. <laughs> These are complicated systems. We're sorry. We try to keep them as simple as we can, but it was Einstein's line as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, if you're using an application, uh, if you want to run some application on our, on our machines, um, and it is possible for you to run it on your own personal laptop or desk side computer or whatever, um, do it there first. So you're, you make sure you understand how to invoke it, how to arrange the input and output files, um, see if you can figure out, uh, from the documentation, um, uh, what the what the parallel options are? Is this a threaded uh, application? Is this a, a distributed memory application? Is it not parallel at all? Figure that stuff out. Um, and uh, if you have trouble with the documentation or the experimentation, um, then by all means write us, um, and we'll try to help you with that. Um, once you move to the cluster, um, there is another thing you can do besides jumping straight into S batch. If you want to, to, to test things out and make sure you understand the way everything's working. You can run interactive jobs and an interactive job means you are asking Slurm for the same resources, time, 
CPUs, potentially GPUs, memory. You're asking Slurm for the same resources, except instead of just executing that shell script out of sight, um, that shell script, uh, you can get um, a shell that you can interact with. You can type commands, try stuff, see what the results is, type more commands, check environment variables, all that kind of stuff. Um, there are two ways to do this. Two different commands will do this for you. There is s alloc or salloc. I pronounce it s alloc. And there is s run. What's the, and they take the same sort of arguments as s batch that we've already seen dash dash time dash dash n tasks or CPUs per task uh, dash dash mem per CPU or dash dash mem, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So the same directives that we've been seeing all along, they both take those. Um, uh, let's see, s alloc, the first one, will give you an interactive shell, the way we have things set up on Compute Canada. So if I type s alloc dash dash time equals one hour dash dash n tasks equals two, I'm actually going to try doing that and show you what it, what it, what we expect it to look like. s alloc dash dash time equals, uh, I'm going to make it 15 minutes, hour. 15 minutes, zero seconds, dash dash n tasks equals two. Um, let me see, oh, right, sorry, I forgot. I am one of these people who has to supply the dash dash account specifier. Uh, let's see, debug, let's try that. Mem per CPU. Well, this demonstration isn't going particularly smoothly, is it? It is demonstrating something I, I was going to put on a, a slide a little further down, though, which is that if you try sbatch or salloc or one of these and you get an error, just read the error. It's long here, but basically this first one, I, I, I read it very quickly because I've seen it many times, but the error says, you are associated with multiple allocations. Please specify one of the following accounts to submit this job. Use the parameter dash dash count equals desired account. So if you parse that slowly, you realize it's telling you that this command here needs to have dash dash account equals one of these things added to it, or one of these things. So I did that. I added dash dash account equals CC debug because it, it's specified for me. It won't work for you. You'll get a different list. Um, and then it gives me a different error. It says incorrect memory request. Please specify memory per CPU. This is an, an annoying little feature that I wish we could figure out how to fix, but I'm just going to do what it says instead. Mem per CPU equals one gig. And having actually read all the error messages, then my interactive job goes kind of like this. It gives me a bunch of stuff and eventually it gives me a prompt back. And, and I can see from the prompt that I'm now no longer running on a login node. I'm running on, as it happens, Graham 93. And I can just do things like echo uh, environment variables and execute commands and so on. And after 15 minutes, whether I like it or not, it's going to end the job and, and log me out from Graham 93. Or I can finish sooner just by typing exit and relinquish my job allocation. So that's the uh, that's probably the most uh, useful tool for uh, spinning yourself up for for trying out um, applications for the first time on the HPC cluster. Uh, S run works a little bit like that, except you actually name the allocation you want app, the application. I'm sorry that you want to run, and it runs it directly instead of giving you the interactive shell. But if your application is interactive, then you get sort of the same effect. Um, the time you can take to for an interactive job is uh, not actually limited to three hours. You can request longer numbers, but you might not get it. You might just it might just sit there at this prompt here, waiting for resources. Uh, it could sit there for hours potentially. It could sit there for hours even if you give it a small number like fifteen. If things are really ridiculously busy, we can't quite cure that. But um, you've got pretty good odds if your time is less than three hours that you will get in reasonably promptly. So that worked. You've tested your application. You are confident that you have no appropriate number of CPUs to, to ask for to get it to run in parallel. Or maybe you don't know exactly how many CPUs you want to get it to run as fast as you want, but you at least know how to make it work. 
you got some output that makes sense. Did it actually run in parallel? Did it run efficiently? This sort of thing. The next tool to show you is CEF or SEFF, which is short for Slurm Efficiency. And you supply a job ID number to that. Um, and you see if your runtime CPU and memory requests were reasonable. Um, then uh, when you can see uh, your CPU and memory efficiency, then you may want to may want to tweak your CPU and memory requests um, in your subsequent jobs, perhaps. Again, remembering to leave a little bit of safety room in your runtime and, and your memory. Um, if you're scaling up because your test job is small and your real work is bigger, um, then if your real work is four times complex, maybe expect the, the job to take four times the runtime. It doesn't always work that way. Um, but uh, if, if you don't have better information, then uh, that's a place to start. And then after you've run the real job, use Ceph to verify again. So what does Ceph look like? Here's an output example. Um, I'm running Ceph on a made up job ID. Um, on and it just echoes the job ID back uselessly and tells me what cluster I'm on. Uselessly, I already knew that. Thank you, Slurm. Um, and it tells you who you are, which we already knew also. Finally, get to the interesting stuff. Um, the uh, the uh, the state says uh, completed exit code zero. Now there are a number of things that can come up here. The exit code zero, for those of you who understand shell scripts, is simply the uh, exit code from the job script. Um, it's possible for that to be zero and still to have some more interesting state than completed. Uh, it tells you how many nodes you were running on, uh, how many cores per node. Uh, this uh, CPU utilized is the amount of CPU that the operating system logged the uh, all the uh, processes as using. Um, and then this next line here is next line here is where things get interesting. 70.45% of seven hours, 22 minutes. If you multiply, let's see, uh, job wall clock time. So the wall clock time, the next row says 27 minutes and 40 seconds. This job, that tells you how long the job ran. So that's useful if you're setting your time limits, right? This job took 27 minutes and 40 seconds to complete. That's useful information. Um, did it use its CPUs efficiently? Well, if you multiply 27 hour, 27 minutes and 40 seconds, pardon me, by 16 cores, you will find that that adds up to 7 hours and 22 minutes and 40 seconds. So that's the maximum possible CPU time that this program could have used if it was running flat out on all 16 cores for all 27 minutes and 40 seconds. But it didn't. It used 5 hours and 11 minutes worth of that 7 hours and 22 minutes, which is about 70%. So it's not using those 16 cores perfectly efficiently. Now 70% is not bad. No one is going to get get on your case about running at 70% efficiency on 16 cores. That's that's okay. But you might do better. So if this was the result from my first run um, on uh, of, of well first run a run of my application and the next time I was going to run it was going to be a similar sized problem um, like the same dimensions of my grid or whatever the measure of your size your problem is then I would consider maybe using a smaller number of cores per node because I'm not using all of those 16 effectively I'd say maybe submit it with, uh, let's see, what's 70% of 16? I'd, I'd maybe submit it with 12 cores and see whether the runtime is still good enough for my purposes. It might run a little slower. It might run exactly the same time. It's even possible it may run faster because there are other things that affect run speed besides just the number of cores, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's how you can use this sort of information from Ceph. It also talks about memory efficiency. So um, it's down here, it says this job asked for 50 gigabytes of memory and it used three and a half gigabytes of them. So it's memory efficiency. Uh, it was really pretty low and you could afford to ask for less memory than that. I'm almost certain. You could probably, let's see, 16 cores, 3.5 gigabytes in total. You could certainly get away with asking for one gigabyte per core. You could probably get away with, get away with asking for half a gigabyte per core. Um, doing the math here, you could even go as low as quarter gigabyte per core, so about 250 megabytes per core. I might not go quite that 
aggressive on the memory optimization if it were me, but I would certainly reduce the number from whatever, from that 50 that I had submitted the first time, because I don't need that much. Uh, let's see, so clear the drawings. And yeah, okay, right, I already highlighted this. <laughs> Let me talk about troubleshooting a little bit. Something else went wrong. Um, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong and uh, both for helping yourself and for getting us to help you, we need to distinguish between what they were. Did the sbatch command succeed or the salloc command succeed? Um, I inadvertently demonstrated for you, uh, what you what you should do in that case. If you type sbatch and it comes back with an error message like, this nonsense I got here, then simply read the error message first and see if you can understand what it's telling you to do. Um, our error messages on when S batch or S alloc fails are, in my opinion, pretty good, and uh, they'll usually get you going straight without uh, without further help. Uh, if not, if you can't understand what it says, write us support at compucanada.ca. We'll straighten you out. Um, Second type of thing that went wrong is, yeah, the job ran, but I didn't get the results I expected um, or didn't get any results at all. So the first thing to do there is check all the possible output files for error messages. I already showed you the slurm dash job ID dot out file. Um, and uh, we commented at the time that you can also redirect output to another file in your script. Um, I have also seen some applications that think they know exactly where everything should go and so they, they have a list of files in which they put different sorts of output. You want to find all of those and check whether there's some error message in one of those. If you can find an error message, if you can find an error message, perhaps you can make sense of it and know what to do. If you can find an error message but can't make sense of it, send it to us, support at computecanada.ca and uh, you know tell us the job id number because we always love to have that um, tell us what application you're running maybe show us the job script and uh, we'll help you figure out what went wrong um, and uh, you might also check ceph because ceph will sometimes have some interesting information so here's an example of a thing that went wrong so we have our uh, we run a job didn't get the results we expected in the output file um, we see uh, this message, slurm step D error detected one um kill event in step blah, 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 blah. What does that mean? Well, specialized information is required here. Um kill is short for out of memory killer. It's a, a Linux process that makes sure that programs that are using too much memory don't interfere with the operating system and bring down the whole node. So this rather obscure message here, detected one umkill event, um, is uh, essentially saying that the job tried to use more memory than it requested. Um, down below, uh, we have a couple other Ceph outputs that we can compare side by side um, for, uh, for more information. You'll see that the one on the left here actually includes the state is something other than completed. And look, the Xcode is still a zero, but the state is out of memory. That's a good sign that you need to actually request more memory. I'll also draw your attention to the fact that this job reporting out of memory as its state shows a memory efficiency of only 19%. That may seem weird, but what's going on is uh, what is probably going on, um, there's a lot of things that can happen, but what's most likely going on there is that this job um, was cooking along at uh, 11 megabytes of memory used and then uh, it went to the operating system and said, okay, I need, uh, I need a couple of gigabytes of memory. And the operating system said, sorry, you only have 60, you're done. Um, and so it immediately got the out of memory error, but the, the requested amount of memory does not appear in the utilized and efficiency calculation, just what it was using before it went over the, the fence. Um, in other case, I think the, the other one on the right here is essentially a recap of what I showed you earlier. 53% uh, memory efficiency is a little bit better. Um, and 98% CPU efficiency is brilliant. That's fantastic.
few more best practices. Um, we're getting very near the end here. Um, if you want to test your application um, on a very small data set um, and it's going to, you only need a few minutes and a few gigabytes like less than 10 cpu minutes and less than four gigabytes then you can you are welcome to execute the ad application right on the login node without getting the scheduler involved at all that's okay if you're if you expect to go past those thresholds of about 10 cpu minutes or about four gigabytes either one um, then we ask please use the scheduler use s batch submitted as a batch job that goes away and comes back later or s alloc or s run to to run it interactively but they will run interactively on one of the compute nodes then um, another uh, don't um, don't submit jobs automatically like having a job script that uses a loop to submit a hundred jobs at once um, that's really hard in the scheduler getting bombarded by a uh, uh, hundred job submissions at one time, or even ten at one. I mean, the job scheduler works plenty hard already with just human beings typing in these things. We get a new job submitted on the major clusters, Graham and Cedar, about every two to six seconds on average. That's just without anybody doing anything automatic. Um, if you have to run a lot of similar tasks, use something called a job array, which um, is documented here. I'll take you over to docs again. Oops, that's not the docs page. That is. Uh, so we're going to scroll back up to the top, use the search box, and look for job array. And there's a page called job arrays. It's also linked from running jobs, which lays out how you can have the scheduler um, do the moral equivalent of submitting 100 jobs for you, except you get to do it with only one command and it doesn't beat up the scheduler quite so hard. So if you've got a lot of uh, effectively identical jobs, um, just varying in some some parameter that doesn't matter to the scheduler, all, all the same runtime, all the same memory requests, all the same program to run, um, then use job arrays for that. Um, in comparison with this first line about tests of under 10 CPU minutes, um, when you're in production, when you're actually doing substantial amounts of computing, you're, you're out of your test phase, please don't uh, use really short jobs. Jobs shorter than, say, around 10 minutes or so are kind of wasteful. The scheduler may burn as much as a minute um, getting a job scheduled, started, dispatched, cleaned up. And if the job's only doing 10 minutes of useful work, then then there's you know there's a 10% overhead there. The overhead doesn't need to be that big. If you have a bunch of little tasks of like a few minutes scale, then pack those tasks into a larger job using something like, for instance, a shell loop inside your job script. So if I've got uh, 10 10 minute tasks to do, what I could do is give my give 10 times 10 is 100 minutes. I could submit a job that has got a 100 minute uh, runtime limit, uh, add, add a little bonus to that, make it uh, 120 minutes, two hours, submit a two hour job with a loop inside it that loops over the 10 minute little tasks I have to do. That's a much more efficient use of the, uh, the system than 10 separate jobs that are that short. And finally, be conscious of IO. This in a certain sense almost deserves a whole extra talk. Um, uh, I mentioned input output right up front as one of the things that causes job run times to vary because the parallel, the, the file systems, the shared file systems, project, scratch, home on our general purpose clusters um, get a lot of traffic and their performance uh, regularly sags under the load from the hundreds of different users with their thousands of different jobs. So be conscious of using input output efficiently as well. Um, if it is possible to set up your workflow so that most of the IO goes to node local storage, so that most of the IO is done to the, uh, the hard disk on the node you're doing the job, running the job on, then do that. That's a little uh, obscure uh, and niche, um, and it only works in, for some workflows. For other workflows, it's, it's really impractical. There's documentation on it on the website. Again, node local storage. We'll go search it up over here. 
node local. Using node local storage, there's a page describing what you need to know to do that. Um, if your workflow is not amenable to this, um, or if it's just too much trouble for you, um, then the best thing to do is to do your IO to Scratch. Um, project is roughly as good as Scratch. We, we're going to call it third best here by a nose. And it's best not to submit your jobs or do IO to home uh, at all if you can avoid it. Um, in fact, on at least one of our clusters, if you submit the job from slash home, uh, Slurm will stop you and say, please don't submit your job from home, use project or scratch. I think that's here. General hand wavy finishing comments. Try to request um, as few resources as possible. I just say the resources that you need, not some larger number that you think you might possibly use. Do, however, allow enough overhead um, in time and memory um, that uh, your job won't crash because a crash job uh, is wasteful for you, obviously, um, and it's wasteful for everyone else because you just got to rerun the same thing again and use the resources twice. Um, so try and try and balance those two competing things. Don't ask for too much, but uh, ask for enough that you're not going to have to rerun things unnecessarily. And then, you know, uh, we've already shown you how you can use Ceph to see what you're really using and walk down from a high number to a, to a more appropriate lower number if you've got jobs that are expected to use similar resources over and over again. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that pretty much is the end of it. Um, I have pointed out the documentation site. Uh, running jobs is the key page there, but there are many linked there from. There are online man pages or dash dash help uh, for the various Slurm commands. Um, there is Slurm documentation at a site called skedmd.com. Skedmd is a company that, uh, that maintains Slurm and provides uh, commercial support for it. And of course, questions can be directed to support at acenet.ca or support at computecanada.ca. And I think we can call that day, stop the recording, and deal with questions if Oliver has left any of them for me. <laughs>